afterwards, I got accepted to Northwestern University with a full scholarship of $260,000. The first one is that I've already lived in the United States. Me and my family, we lived there for about eight years. So there are two types of scholarships. There are merit scholarships and need-based scholarships. Well, that's a very good question. A lot of students would first take a look at ranking and also they would look at the acceptance rates. But personally, I wouldn't think that both of those criteria are very much important. Most students don't think about social media as something very important, but it is a criteria that is worth considering. So if a student gets into a community college, then the chances of them getting a visa is zero. But the UK does not provide as much scholarship opportunities as the US does. Does IELTS play any role in application process of US universities? And what's the minimum SAT score that can ensure that a student is going to get a decent level of scholarship? To check your English knowledge, I made a mistake on pronunciation, vocabulary and grammar each during the interview, so the person who finds these mistakes and leaves them as comments will receive a valuable prize. So, watch the interview carefully, find these mistakes and leave them as comments. Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel and today we are going to have an interview with one of the top SAT instructors in Uzbekistan, that's Abdulaziz Sharapov. Abdulaziz, hello. Assalamu Thank you very much for agreeing to have an interview with us about SAT and uh, university application courses. Can you please first shortly introduce yourself to our auditory? Well, as you already mentioned, my name is Abdulaziz Sharapov and for the past two years I've been instructing SAT. At first I started off with individual lessons and when those were going very well I decided to open my own SAT course. All right, and uh, what about your university application? I was studying at Tashkent International School for about three years. There I had a full scholarship of $90,000. And afterwards, I got accepted to Northwestern University with a full scholarship of $260,000. Now, in this entire process, I've learned a lot about what you need to do and what you shouldn't do during the application process. And so I decided to myself, because there was no one exactly to help me with this process, I want to be the one to actually help other people. So as we know, TAS is one of the most expensive schools in Uzbekistan, right? Probably the most expensive. Yeah, uh, and uh, what are the processes that uh, help students to get this scholarship? Like, uh, is it, how, like, how possible is it to have a scholarship from this school? And what are the requirements? Well, every single year there's about 100 Uzbek students who apply for the scholarship and they go through multiple stages. And at the very end, only three students get accepted. Like, do you need any, let's say, international certificates or extracurricular uh, achievements to get this scholarship? Well, no, they have their own testing process. So first you need to fill out the application form, then you go for the first stage. During the first stage they test your math, English, and logic abilities. Then if you're selected for the next stage, then you go for essay writing and also teamwork activities. And then after that, they select eight students for the interview. Among those eight students, whoever they like the most during the interview, they accept. As we know from your Instagram page, uh, you have applied to and been accepted to uh, Northwestern University in Qatar, right? Yes. So why exactly uh, Qatar? So you have a lot of uh, options, right? You could easily be accepted to any US top university, but why did you choose this university? Well, that's true. Uh, there's multiple factors that went into my application to Qatar universities. The first one is that I've already lived in the United States. Uh -huh. uh, me and my family, we lived there for about eight years uh, when I was a child. And so going to the United States again would have been great, but at the same time, I wanted a new experience at a different country. The second reason was because it's much easier to get accepted to Qatar universities. There's less demand because less people know about the opportunity and the chance of you getting a scholarship is very high because there's the Qatar Foundation. They are the ones who fund all of these scholarships. Mm -hmm. Are you going to stay all these four years in Qatar or are you going to transfer your university? As far as I know, there is a possibility to do an exchange program at Northwestern itself. However, I'm still going to consider whether I do it or not. So uh, for an ordinary student uh, who is just starting uh, his or her application process, would you uh, recommend him or her to apply to a university in US or Qatar, let's say, uh, if he or she has both options? Well, it really depends on their own priorities because I do know that some people have an American dream which they want to fulfill and so the United States would probably be on their top priority. However, if there's a student who simply wants to get accepted with scholarship and to study abroad, then I think Qatar would be a very good option for them. Apart from Qatar, there are also some other options, such as Turkey that also accepts SAT. You can also apply to South Korea and China, 
Even though a lot of people think that China is not a good option, it's a very safe place for international students to be. Even after 2020? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So um, what's the um, most important criteria in getting a scholarship? Let's say, uh, is it extracurricular activities or like achievements or uh, is it GPA or is it SAT? What most people misunderstand is how a scholarship works abroad. So there are two types of scholarships. There are merit scholarships and need-based scholarships. So the merit scholarships are the ones that are given based off how much the student has accomplished. For example, if they have a certain level of SAT, they might get a certain scholarship. On top of that, if they have a certain GPA, they'll get even more scholarship. However, most students apply for need-based scholarship. This means that based on their financial circumstances, they will be awarded a certain amount of money. There are some universities that provide full demonstrated aid. This means that however much money the student needs, that much will be given to them. So after they get accepted to a full demonstrated aid university, they would need to prove that their family circumstances is not enough to fund their education. And from that, they would be able to win a full scholarship. Uh -huh. Well, I guess in Uzbekistan, an average salary is uh, suitable for that scholarship, right? Yeah, pretty much. Almost uh, anyone from Uzbekistan would qualify. So what do you think is the most important uh, factor uh, that students or applicants should take into consideration while choosing university? Well, that's a very good question. A lot of students would first take a look at ranking and also they would look at the acceptance rate. But personally, I wouldn't think that both of those criteria are very much important. First of all, because ranking is very subjective. They don't exactly know what the ranking is based off of and easily the ranking could be faked. Second of all, uh, acceptance rate. The acceptance rate is based on a global scale. They are taking every single applicant into consideration. So even though it looks like 30% acceptance rate for that university might be very good, you don't exactly know what your chances as an Uzbek student is to get accepted. Now, what I would instead recommend for them to do is to take a look if that university has any other Uzbek students who are currently studying there with a full scholarship. And if there is other Uzbek people who are currently studying there with a full scholarship, then at that point, they can compare themselves to that student and think, do I have a chance or do I not? This is a much better way to approach which universities you're going to apply for. And um, personally, you, why, why did you like, specifically chose U.S. to study, U.S. university? Interesting question. <laughs> so, why should any, let's say, applicant, uh, why not go to, let's say, Europe? Why not go to an Asian university? Why especially American university? I would say that American universities are very uh, conventional. Possibly that's the reason. Um, they've been existing for a very long time. For example, if you take a look at some of the oldest universities, they're 400 or 500 years old. So definitely they have experience uh, from that aspect. It's better than studying at a university that was opened in the past 40 years. They've only had a few generations of students and are not very much experienced with their teaching. But I have uh, graduated from British University and uh, I've heard that British University and British education system is so popular in the whole globe. And uh, as we can see in Uzbekistan also, like different universities are trying to get a license of those universities, British, but uh, no one is trying uh, except Webster to uh, take the license of US universities. That's a very good point you brought up. Uh, I think the reason for why most people are going to US universities is simply because they provide more scholarship opportunities. Mm -hmm. I do have some students who apply for UK and Canadian universities, but unfortunately, if you're not a Canadian citizen, it's very hard to win a scholarship there. Same thing with uh, UK. Um, it's obviously cheaper to study in UK without a scholarship compared to studying in USA without a scholarship. Mm -hmm. But the UK does not provide as much scholarship opportunities as the US does. So uh, several years ago, before you started teaching SAT or uh, let's say teaching applicants have to apply to the universities of US, uh, studying in the US for Uzbek uh, applicants was almost impossible. So no one was, almost no one was trying to uh, get accepted to these universities. And uh, why do you think, like, is this a very popular myth about uh, US universities that uh, you'll be rejected, you cannot get scholarship there, uh, even if you are accepted, you cannot get the visa. Uh, is it a popular myth or uh, people were just uh, afraid? The issue in the past is that most people were not applying with the right mindset. Uh -huh. uh, they were applying with the Uzbek mindset of just sending their IELTS score and their uh, other test scores and then getting accepted right away. 
Unfortunately, the American application process is much more complex. Obviously, you need to send them your school grades, your SAT, IELTS, but on top of that, they will also look at your essays. They will look at what type of recommendations you have, and also your extracurricular activities might play a role. So when it really comes down to US universities, Uzbek students have never really been experienced in this sphere. I remember five years ago when my brother got accepted to Yale and US University with a full scholarship, there was nobody else in Tashkent who was getting such types of scholarships. And that's specifically because there was no one to ever teach them. My brother had to learn the entire application process on his own, spending 200, 300 hours on this entire process. I think your brother was the first, first Uzbek person who, uh, who got accepted to uh, Yale and US, right? If not mistaken. Yeah, the first. So um, we'll leave the uh, Instagram profile of Abdurraz's brother. Uh, his name is Abdurrahad, if I'm not mistaken, right? So Abdur Sharafi, you can find him on Instagram and you can learn about his, the whole like process also. Well, does IELTS play any role in application process of US universities? The thing about IELTS is that it's simply a requirement. Mm -hmm. The universities want to see if an international student can actually speak English enough to understand the program. So thinking about how it's just a requirement, you don't need to push beyond the requirement. Some students think that if they get IELTS 8 or IELTS 8.5, it would really increase their chances. But in actuality, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. If the university requires 6.5, a student with 6.5 and a student with 8 are going to have the exact same chances. All right, then it means that an ordinary applicant can just uh, start uh, being prepared for IELTS and get, let's say, uh, that minimum requirement and uh, try more on SAT and uh, other application like steps, right? Yeah, and that's what I really recommend to students as well. Instead of first trying to take IELTS, they should focus on the other application parts, for example, the SAT. After studying for SAT and being able to reach the level of getting 1400 or 1450, if you take IELTS after that, you'll realize how much more simple it is compared to the SAT, and you don't have to prepare as long. You can simply score seven, or maybe even 7.5 after your SAT preparation. So then what do you think is the uh, like minimum level of general English that people, that applicants need uh, to start SAT course? Well, personally for our course, I recommend students to have at least intermediate or above. But also on the SAT, there's a math section. For students, I would recommend them to have basic knowledge in ninth grade algebra. And what's the minimum SAT score that uh, can ensure that a student is going to get uh, a decent level of scholarship? Now, it's a big issue calling it a minimum requirement or minimum score, specifically because there is really no minimum. Mm -hmm. The SAT is graded holistically. Mm -hmm. That means that the higher you receive, the higher chances you have. The lower you receive, the lower scholarship you'll get. Now, if I take a look at my own students with full scholarships, the one with the lowest SAT score was 1,330. Uh -huh. What so, about partial scholarship? Oh, for partial scholarship, the chances are much higher. You could have 1,100 and still get a partial scholarship. However, partial scholarship is not as preferable because even with a partial scholarship, you need to pay ten tens of thousands of dollars to the university and also your living costs are going to be more than $10,000. So uh, how possible is it for an Uzbek student uh, to get full scholarship to top universities, let's say Ivy League universities? Well, if we're talking specifically about Ivy League, um, the chances are very low. If you think about the past few years, we've really had no students getting accepted to Ivy League universities. Is it because we are Uzbek people or is it because our, let's say, SAT scores? Well, there's actually two factors. And I like what you said about we are Uzbek people. There is a possibility, and this is just speculation, this is not a fact, that because no Uzbek student has been accepted to these universities before, the universities do take a look at us and feel like they cannot trust us yet to actually be accepted. But once the door has been opened to one Uzbek, it becomes much easier to get accepted after that. When my brother got accepted to Yale and US, afterwards we got another student the next year, and we got two more students the year after that, and another two more students. So what do you think is the main reason of it? Well, it is based on stereotypes. And universities will make stereotypes because they're at a high risk. They don't want to take a chance and accept a student who might end up ruining their uh, reputation or ruining their ranking. 
So that's why they're very careful during this entire process and stereotypes are taken into consideration. Is, it this, like, is there a special guy who sits in the office and learns all <laughs> different nationalities and how people are behaving in the university? <laughs> well, not exactly. Um, I would say that the biggest concern is that they might accept a student who doesn't perform as well as they thought they would. For example, they aren't able to keep up their GPA at university very well, or maybe they are simply causing problems in their lessons. Are these students uh, who get scholarship from top universities in the U.S. are expected to stay in, Uzbek uh, in the U.S. or uh, like they can do whatever they want after graduating? Well, it really depends on them. Uh, your student visa would expire as soon as you graduate. So if you're able to find a job after that, you're able to apply for a work visa and you'd be able to live there freely. After living in the United States for five years, you can then get a citizenship. You could apply for it. And honestly, the process of citizenship is very easy. They'll give you a civics test and the civics test is very manageable, especially compared to everything else the student has been through. It's really the easiest thing. If they're able to get citizenship, then they're free to do whatever they want. Then uh, it means to some extent that those people who are graduating from top universities uh, from Uzbekistan will decide what's going to happen with the next generation then, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. All right. So I forget the question. I'm sorry. Ibrahim, we will cut. What do you think about Elyurt Umida Fund? Well, the Elyurt Umida Fund is actually a very great opportunity that the Uzbek government has created. For those who don't know, the Ilyut Umid Foundation is a sponsorship that the Uzbek government provides for students. They will choose random students to sponsor if they've been accepted to top 300 universities. And afterwards, they will pay for any amount of education that is required. For example, if a student got a partial scholarship and still needs to pay $20,000 per year, well then the Uzbek government, if they choose to sponsor that student, will then pay for their education. All right, so uh, as we know, there are some requirements of Ilir Tumida also. So um, a person who got this scholarship have to uh, work for a specific period of time in Uzbekistan after graduating from the university. And uh, don't you think that it will lead to brain drain after several years? Like uh, people who have studied in the US will probably uh, want to stay there, uh, let's say after three or five years of working in Uzbekistan. And uh, doesn't it like eventually cause brain drain? Well, I would say that the, the requirement that students have to come back and work for five years does limit the amount of brain drain that happens. And I do believe that within five years of staying in Uzbekistan and working here, you would probably get to a position in your job that you don't want to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I would say that anyone who's able to win a Lourdes scholarship to get accepted to U.S. universities and study there, they could do very well in five years here in Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. So... I think the Uzbek government is anticipating that students would get to such an extent within those five years to stay. So I think brain drain won't really happen to that extent. So would you recommend students to push themselves to get a full scholarship from the universities, like personally, or uh, try less and get a year to the scholarship? Well, uh, at this point, it really depends on the student's own priorities. For example, if the student really doesn't want to be tied down by the Uzbek government, they should really try to make sure they get a scholarship from those universities. Mm -hmm. However, I still do know some students who want to study abroad and come back to Uzbekistan so that they can do very well here in our country. For those types of students, Ilyurt is actually a very good opportunity. They don't have to try as hard. They can rely on the Uzbek government's support and come back here and just work. Can you please once again count all the like main requirements of getting a scholarship? That's like SAT, that's GPA, and uh, extracurricular achievements, right? Well, there's specifically eight uh, components that you need for getting accepted. Uh, the first thing that you need to send universities is your school grades, mm -hmm. also known as GPA. Uh, then we have standardized tests, for example, SAT or ACT. Then we also have college essays, the essays that the universities require from you. Then we have recommendation letters. These recommendation letters need to come from your teachers at school. You can also send additional optional recommendation letters. And then we have extracurricular activities. Then we have the art portfolio for anyone who is applying for something artistic or creative. Finally, students should also focus on their online presence, their social media. Most students don't think about social media as something very important, but it is a criteria that is worth considering. And finally, we have IELTS requirement. And uh, what extracurricular activities like, can uh, students try to get? 
Well, I would personally recommend students to focus on three categories when they're actually choosing their extracurriculars. The first one is service. They should at least try to help someone else or the community. On top of that, they should also focus on physical activities, something such as sports that would actually take your physical uh, strength. And finally, creativity. Creativity focuses on things that you would actually create on your own. It could be some form of art, it could be dancing, or it could even be creating a online blog. What kind of like social media pages do universities accept from students? Well, if we're talking about a student's personal page, all they have to do is make sure that their page is presentable. Mm -hmm. What I mean by presentable is when somebody else looks at their page, they can see a decent human being. Now, if you want to know if your social media page is presentable or not, I would recommend showing it to your uncle or your uh, auntie. <laughs> if you can show it to them without uh, feeling ashamed, then yes, your page is presentable. <laughs> so uh, what are your like, personal recommendations to applicants? Like, uh, what, what do they have to try to make it presentable? Well, I would say that uh, you probably should start on following some strange accounts because they could go through your account's pages. I know that universities don't like it when students follow meme pages, especially if those meme pages post racist or derogatory content. So if you're following anything that's racist or if you're saying anything that's racist, just don't do it. It's not worth your time. If the university finds out, they will drop your application. Let's now um, discuss some of the issues uh, that are connected with SAT. So uh, as we know, SAT is more difficult than any, let's say, standardized test like um, IELTS or TOEFL and so on. And uh, because it mainly asks scientific language, right? So that works with scientific language. And uh, what's the best source for, let's say, academic vocabulary or for practice tests for SAT learners? Well, first off, for somebody who's starting to prepare for SAT, in order to increase their vocabulary, I would recommend a book called College Panda Vocabulary. There, there's a lot of basic words that are very much useful on the SAT itself, 400 words in total. Then afterwards, they can start learning vocabulary from other books. Uh, when it comes to finding practice tests, I would recommend them to complete the practice tests that can be found on Han Academy. There are eight of them in total, and if they solve those practice tests, they would do very well. Afterwards, then they can start focusing on past papers that can be found from previous years of testing. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned about ACT also. What are the differences between SAT and ACT? Well, overall, the knowledge required for both of them is pretty much the same. However, the main difference is within the structure. Um, they do cover both the same question types, overall, but the structure is different. The biggest difference that people will notice is that there's only one math section and there's also a science section. Now, students should not be worried about the science section because it's actually very similar to the SAT reading science passages, except it focuses a little bit more on the scientific aspect. Mm -hmm. And also, there's a part that's called grammar, students shouldn't worry about the grammar section either. It's pretty much the same thing as the writing section of the SAT. All right, then can we conclude that um, SAT is better for younger applicants and ACT is more scientific and uh, that will be more suitable for uh, older applicants? Like, yeah, I guess we could say that, especially for most students because not everybody is keen on science probably it's better for them to take the SAT. Uh -huh. And we have a new test that was uh, so popularized after COVID-19, uh, that's Duolingo. And what would we say about Duolingo? Duolingo is actually a very good test. So a lot of people think that it appeared after the COVID pandemic, but in actuality, it's been around for more than five years. Well, it became popular after COVID-19. Exactly, because there was a big need for it. The good part about Duolingo is that it's cheaper than IELTS. It only costs $50, whereas IELTS, I think the price is almost $200. Uh, second of all, it's more convenient to take. You don't have to register for a test center. You don't have to show your passport. You don't have to wait to go to the test center in order to take your test. You can do all of it on your laptop. You register for the test, you make your payment. As soon as you make your payment, you're allowed to take the test within three weeks. And afterwards, the even better part is that your score comes out very quickly. For IELTS, you wait about two weeks for your score to be released. Duolingo, you wait maximum two days. 
What about the math skills that are required for ACT or SAT? Like, uh, what's the minimum level that students should have uh, while joining SAT courses? Or um, what level of math skills should they have uh, to start, let's say, self-studying to prepare for SAT or ACT? Basic knowledge from ninth grade algebra. That way they can guarantee they understand some of the easier concepts. And after they understand those easier concepts, they can start moving over to statistics and also geometry later on. Are Uzbek schools powerful enough? or let's say suitable enough to prepare students for math skills that are needed for SAT? Well, I would say that uh, yes, in order for a student to reach the level of math needed, they could definitely learn that math at a local school. However, the local school math is not enough to take the SAT. Why? Because the test is mainly based off of logic and critical thinking. Uh, with just DTM type of math, you would not be able to take the SAT logic math. And what would you uh, recommend applicants? Uh, what can they do to improve their, let's say, logical thinking and analytical skills that are needed for SAT? What really helps is mainly just practice. Uh -huh. And I know that sounds very basic, but really when it comes to learning, things have to be basic. Um, the more a student practices, the more they'll get used to the concepts on the SAT. They'll understand the structure better and how the questions are graded. That way, the more they practice, the more better they'll get for the next time. And all this information that we have been discussing uh, since the beginning of this interview were about bachelor's degree, right? And there have been some questions uh, by my followers that asked about master's degree application process and uh, the tests that are required for them. Unfortunately, for master's degree, I don't know entirely about the whole process, but there are tests such as the GRE and GMAT that work for master's degree. The difference between GRE and GMAT is that GMAT is specifically made for uh, MBA, so Master's in Business Administration, whereas the GRE, it's more of a general test uh, and it's more universal for other types of majors, just like the SAT. Are these tests also compulsory to get accepted to the university? Actually, US no. Universities? Yeah. When it comes to Master's degree, you don't exactly have to take these tests. Um, it would definitely increase your chances of getting accepted with a full scholarship. However, there's other components that are taken into consideration. Uh, for example, work experience. Most master's students are expected to have a certain amount of experience working and to have recommendation letters from different places they've worked at. And uh, another very popular issue or notorious issue in Uzbekistan is um, to get a visa, a US visa. So um, there are some myths uh, and there are some uh, very popular circumstances when uh, students are rejected visa, uh, even if they have been accepted to the university. And um, a lot of people think that it's almost impossible to get a visa for, let's say, a master's degree, uh, even if they have scholarship. And what do you think about these uh, myths? Well, it really depends on why the student is being rejected. Um, the embassy takes many things into consideration. Let's say that the student has been accepted to a university and got a full scholarship. Well, they're probably not going to get rejected. The only case where they would be rejected is if in the past they've had some issues uh, with their bank statement or they've had issues with uh, the U.S. government before. Like maybe their family members decided to uh, get a green card, but then they never came back after 10 years. That could be possible. Or if their family members have been to the United States before and have been deported. In cases like that, then yes, the student might get rejected even with a full scholarship. Does university ranking also play a role when getting a visa? Yes, it does. So the embassy will take a look at what type of university it is and if it's prestigious enough for them to give you a visa. For example, if a student is getting accepted to a community college, a community college is a low-ranked university with just two years of study, uh, one of the more basic types of universities. So if a student gets into a community college, then the chances of them getting a visa is zero because the university knows that his main reason for getting into that university is to just graduate as quickly as possible and to just start working at a low, at a low job. Uh -huh. What about schools, like high schools, secondary schools in the US? Uh, what's the probability of getting a visa? If you get accepted to a high school? Yes. Well, I would say it's pretty high uh -huh. because the types of high schools in USA that would accept an international student, those are some prestigious schools. For example, I have a friend who studied at Barstow School. Uh, Barstow is ranked sixth place in terms of all high schools in USA. And he was able to get his visa quite easily. 
I had a student who got accepted to uh, North Scholars Academy and he got a visa as well, quite easily, because his school is very prestigious. So uh, that means that the higher the ranking of the university is, the higher uh, like opportunity of getting a visa the, the applicants have, right? Yeah. All right. So um, what about the recent trend uh, that students or applicants started to um, like register for the embassies in other countries, just as UAE, uh, or uh, I've heard about some Asian countries also that uh, applicants are traveling to, uh, getting a visa from the, those embassies. I think we should keep the ones in uh, Asia a secret for now because we don't want too many people going there. I have some options that I'm telling my students about I'm not going to make it public. But UAE is a great example. I remember last year one of my friends went to the UAE to get his visa and before that I've never heard of anyone who did that before. So the, uh, like, isn't it going to um, play any role uh, for being accepted to the university or being suspicious? Well, I mean, not exactly, because the main goal is just to get the visa stamp onto your passport. Mm -hmm. And because the chances of getting that stamp is higher in UAE, that's why students are going there. It doesn't affect their university education at all. And uh, what spheres would you recommend applicants to choose? Uh, what courses would you recommend them to get? Well, it really does depend on the student itself. Uh, obviously, if they're going for something more basic, such as business administration or economics, at that point, their chances of getting accepted would probably be higher. The reason is because there's many more universities who provide these programs and provide scholarships for them. Whereas when it comes to something like law or medicine, getting a scholarship for those types of programs is much more difficult and you study for more years. So for a student who doesn't really care what major they're going to choose, and please definitely care about what major you're going to choose, it's probably better for them to go for business administration or something like economics or finance. Isn't it too broad? Like everyone is studying a business administration, business marketing, business management, and uh, there are so many people in European countries also, especially in the UK. Uh, well, I think like that's my uh, like uh, personal uh, your point that thousands of students are studying um, business administration and the uh, like all courses that are connected with business in the UK and um, like a lot of people think that uh, the narrower course you choose and uh, the higher opportunity you have to get a visa or to to be accepted to the university because uh, like thousands of people are just flocking to those uh, business areas uh, don't you think that um, those people who are choosing let's say engineering or medicine uh, that are less popular have higher opportunities of getting a scholarship? Well, it really depends on the university at this point. Some universities just won't provide scholarships for those programs. Because engineering is so demanded and you can get a very good job afterwards, the university is less incentivized to give you a scholarship because of that. Like, for example, a medical scholarship is almost impossible for an international student to get, especially if it's a full scholarship. We're not talking about partial scholarships. But if it's a full scholarship, the chances of getting it are nearly zero. And as we know from European universities, there are like uh, two, two periods, fall semester and spring semester. And uh, people have some like specific uh, deadlines, periods of application. And uh, like what about in the US? When should applicants start processing? That's a very good question because a lot of students wait till the summer of graduation to start applying, but no, they need to start focusing eight or nine months before that because most universities, they have a lot of students applying, so they start the application process very early. Early action, the deadline is November 1st and you get your notification in December. Afterwards, there's regular decision. And regular decision, the deadline is January 1st, and the students will get notified in March. Why do they need to get notified in March? Well, so that then they could start preparing for university afterwards and also have enough time to get their visa. Mm -hmm. So that means that for U.S. universities also there are two, uh, two periods, right, of application? I would say there's three. Uh, the two main ones are uh -huh. early action and regular decision, the ones I just talked about. But there's also rolling admissions. Some universities will wait until May 1st to accept additional students. However, the bad part about rolling admissions is that most scholarships have already been taken and you are very unlikely to get a scholarship from the rolling admissions process. And do all these students start studying uh, from the first term or second term? Well, they all start from the first term. Uh -huh. That means uh, that's in September, right? Yeah, September, August.
A lot of people wonder that they are uh, still students, they haven't graduated from school, and they think that it's too early for them to start processing. And uh, does a school diploma or let's say college license diploma in Uzbekistan uh, is going to play any role in the application process? Yes, it does. As I mentioned earlier, um, the universities will look at your school grades. Uh -huh. And to be honest, the GPA is probably the most important component, so even how can more they important start than SAT. Processing earlier then? Well, um, they would first need to focus on their school grades, making sure that it's close to a perfect GPA. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, they simply need to take into consideration there's a test like the SAT or ACT. On top of that, um, they don't really need to focus on essays that early, but they should be focusing on what they want to do in the future. Mm -hmm. What many people get wrong is that you're not really trying to get accepted to a university. Mm -hmm. What you should be thinking about is what you're going to do after university, your big plans, and then make sure that the universities you're choosing match that plan. If you're able to portray that in your essays, in your extracurriculars, at that point, the university is more likely to accept you. They know that you're not just applying to them just to apply to them, but you have something greater. I totally agree with this idea, and soon uh, I was just going to prepare a video about that. Uh, I was going to explain all these applicants of Uzbekistan, uh, and I was going to explain uh, this idea to them. So uh, soon we're going to uh, upload a video about that. So um, then let's take case of ordinary student in Uzbekistan. It's a pupil. Uh, that's uh, 11th grade. That's a last year student at school. And um, he or she hasn't uh, got his diploma yet. So he or she doesn't know the scores, uh, the marks of the GPA. And um, when should this pupil start processing, like the application process? And um, what should be the deadline, like personal deadline for, uh, let's say, writing motivation letters or getting recommendation letters or um, getting a gap year? Is it compulsory for Uzbek pupils or uh, can they, let's say, catch up with September application? Oh, yes, they can. Uh, the thing about uh, 11th grade is that you can actually convert it to 12th grade in USA. So instead of having high school as 9 to 12, Instead, you could actually just make it 8 to 11. And so our 11th grade would be the US 12th grade. That way, taking a gap year is not compulsory. So when a student does reach 11th grade, what I would recommend them to focus on is, first of all, making sure that they have a very good GPA and their SAT scores are good. Then afterwards, they so should... So when should SAT uh, be taken? Like, what's the deadline? Well, I would normally recommend students to have it in August or October. That's August or October of 11th grade or the next year? Yes, of 11th grade. Uh-huh, all right. That way, um, they're able to know which universities they're going to apply for with their scores. Uh -huh. Then once they have their university list ready, they can then start looking at the other components. For example, what essays do they need to write for those universities in particular? Then make sure those essays are written before the deadline. They should also collect all of their academic documents because they would need to send to universities. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned before, the GPA is not ready yet because they haven't graduated. In this case, students need to give a predicted GPA. Are this means, possible? yeah, and that's what all American uh, applications, applicants do. Uh, they predict their GPA, then afterwards, when their official GPA is out, they will send it to their accepted university. You need to be careful here though, because if you predict your GPA too high and your actual GPA is lower than that, some universities might actually take back your acceptance because they say that you're not the student you presented yourself to be. Mm -hmm. But in most cases, that doesn't happen. All right, so that means um, when students have reached, let's say 11th grade at school, uh, by October, they, are, uh, did, like, they should have their predicted scores of GPA and SAT scores. And by spring, next year spring, they have to prepare their uh, letters and the list of universities that they are going to apply for, right? Oh, no, no, no. Because in uh, spring, you'll already be accepted. Uh-huh. So by spring, then they, they uh, should have already uh, chosen, uh, applied everything, and be ready for... By winter. By winter. Yeah. All right, so let's think about how the university application timeline would look. Let's say you just finished 10th grade, and you're about to go into summer holidays. Well, make sure you don't give yourself a summer holiday this year. I know you want to take a break, but hey, you can take a break after you get accepted to university. So the summer of 11th grade 
just make sure that you focus on your applications. Maybe you focus on SAT and also your essay writing skills. But let's say it's October of 11th grade. Make sure you have your SAT already so that you can choose which universities you're going to apply for. And now, once you know which universities you apply for, get a list of the essays that you need to write for that university. Figure out how many recommendation letters you need and make sure your entire application is tidy. Because by November 1st, you have your early action deadline. This means that you need to have applied for round one already. But don't worry, not every student needs to apply for early action. You can wait until January 1st. And so let's say you make sure everything is ready and you submit your application in December for regular decision. Now all you have to do is wait. You wait for the university to ask you for more documents or other types of criteria. But in March, or April, that's when you get your acceptance. This is March or April of 11th grade. Now, yes, you haven't graduated yet, but you are now officially gonna be a university student. At this point, what you need to do is apply for a visa so that you can have your visa by summertime. And once you graduate university in May, make sure you send your final GPA to your universities. That way they can see what kind of grades you graduated with. And in summer, when you get your visa, you are ready to leave. I think that was so helpful for all these applicants who are watching us. Well, um, and how much time does it take, like um, on average, to be prepared for SAT after, let's say, intermediate level? Well, it really depends on the student's own dedication to SAT. Our standard course lasts for five months, and there's also an option for intensive course, which lasts for three months. Now, we've had some very good success with both of these courses. Most of our students receive 1400 or above. Now, that's only because they are actually dedicated. They make sure they come to every single lesson, they do the homework, and most importantly, they listen to my advice. For students like that, who come with the right base and also have dedication, five months is totally enough. But there are some students who are not as consistent. This means that they're not practicing every single week, they miss lessons, and they simply don't do homework. For a student like that, their timeline might have to increase. They won't be able to get 1400 in five months. They would instead need to train much more afterwards. So uh, then can we conclude uh, that 1100 is just enough to be accepted to the US university and 1400 is needed to get full scholarship? Yeah, I would say something around 1400 or 1450. This gives you a good list of universities that would provide a full scholarship. And what's this good list, like top 100, top 200? Well, that would be based off ranking. Most of the universities that give you a full scholarship, a lot of them are liberal arts colleges, mm -hmm. and those don't actually appear on rankings. Mm -hmm. All right. So would you recommend these universities? Definitely. For example, I have two friends who currently study at Grinnell College. Now that university doesn't appear on any rankings, but those colleges don't accept uh, most students. They only accept the most prestigious ones. They simply don't care about ranking, but rather the quality of education. And I know that my two friends who study at Grinnell College, they really do enjoy it. Mm -hmm. All right. And um, we have been informed about your CAC course. And can you please inform our audience also about this course? And uh, that's the second generation, if I'm not mistaken. Third generation. Third generation. Uh -huh. And are you going to continue these uh, generations? Hopefully, yeah. Well, for those who don't know, the CAC is the college application course that I've been holding for the past year. So far, we've had two generations of the college application course, and those have been quite successful. We are about to hold the third generation soon, and there we are going to go through the entire application process from start to finish. This means even for someone who knows nothing about the university application process, by the end of the course, they will actually be ready to start their own applications. So um, that's clear from the whole interview, I think for all the applicants that uh, applying to a US university isn't an easy thing and uh, just getting in let's say SAT or a good score from IELTS is not enough and they have to be informed about the whole process, right? And that's the main reason why I asked Abdulaziz to explain this course, CAC course, and um, I'm pretty sure that they have understood how important it is, and uh, they can easily approach you about this course, right? 
Yeah, definitely. If you have any questions about the college application course or about SAT training, you can write to me on my Instagram page or my Telegram page. Both of them are under the tag Aziz Ropo. So uh, we're going to then provide an Instagram account of Abdulaziz so you can easily approach him about SAT courses and then uh, this CAC course that's uh, so much needed for any applicant who's going to apply to a US university. So thank you very much Abdulaziz about this interview. I think that uh, that was so helpful for all the applicants who are watching us. And uh, I would kindly ask you to um, answer some of the questions that you like. <laughs> Uh, about the university course that are uh, left in the comments below. Sure, definitely. I'll try my best. I'll keep up with the post. If anyone asks something, I'll be there to message. Thank you very much. See you soon. See you too.